see a lot of people struggling with how to manage their money. They aren't keeping track of how much money is coming in and how much is going out. Most kids don't know how to handle money. I'm a big spender, not much of a saver. And I think if I had seen something modeled differently earlier, then I would probably would have a different relationship with money. Financial literacy is really important, especially at a young age. I think World of Money gives them that basis, that financial literacy that they need. World of Money is a youth financial education training institute. It operates Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 445 in July of each year. We go in in the morning, we meet with our classroom leader. Each day is different and each day has a theme and focus. So some days we'll be talking about banking, other days we'll be talking about stocks and bonds. I did learn a lot about credit scores, 401ks, gaining interest on money, making your money work for you, how to save your money, checkings accounts and savings accounts, and yeah, how to live a better life. We put our money into these financial institutes. We've talked to people who are actually financial managers. These are Wall Street professionals, business leaders who are very successful. They'll tell them, this is how I got to this position. This is how I worked my way up. Just having role models like that come and share their knowledge with us is one example between, you know, learning, gaining success, and then giving back. You hearing about it on the TV, on TV and stuff like that, it's one thing, but to actually meet them in person is a different feeling. And it's just a straight, long time. Also, one of the cool things that our students learn is Mandarin Chinese. You know, many CEOs on Wall Street will always also tell you that Mandarin is the language of business. Business is being done overseas, and so now just being exposed to such things as Mandarin and having this type of financial literacy, I think it's just going to really open up the world for them. <laughs> The five tenets of World of Money is learn, earn, save, invest, and donate. Going to this program has helped me become more aware of how much I'm spending and how much I'm saving and how much I'm giving. It's more about, yes, you had an opportunity to earn the money. Now, what do you do to improve the lives of those that are around you and, you know, the future generations? Sabrina had the children go on different outings last year. We chose the outing where we were in our neighborhood and we went around delivering meals to the elderly. What I found is you don't have to have a lot of money to give back. What you need to give is your resources, whether that's money or your time, and that's more important than anything. Oh, oh. We have visited the White House uh, about three times, and two of our young mogul board of directors joined me as I testified on Capitol Hill to talk to Congress about financial education. We've opened or closed the NASDAQ Stock Exchange four times. We were on CNBC, we have been on MSNBC, we have appeared on ABC, NBC. We had the amazing race where our moguls raced from northern Manhattan to Wall Street, broke up into teams and performed tasks for prizes and for education. We encourage our children to invest their money on experiences as opposed to things because treasures of the heart you can never, ever forget. successful. So Miss Lamb dreams us to be ambitious and I think that the tools that she gives us at World of Money are helpful in making sure that those ambitions can be sustained. After becoming a billionaire, I will invest my money in charities to build schools worldwide that will teach finance. It's an amazing program. It's done so much more than just teach me about money. It's taught me about being professional, about working hard, about success. I think World of Money is absolutely amazing. I think these kids are really being set up for the future. That once they hit the ground running, once they get out of college, they're going to be one step ahead of everyone else. What they provide at the program is just immeasurable. It's fun. It's a great way to learn about managing your money. And it's not always to be a charm. It's worth the time and worth the energy, and I think that your children one day will thank you for it. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to World of Money's The Future of Your Money Virtual Town Hall. 
Now, let's get right to it. Down in the bottom of your screen in the chat, definitely want to hear where you are joining us from and your questions because guess what? You are the co-host. Now I have to find something right here and I am so glad that you are here. There we go. Yes, so we are streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. I'm Sabrina Lamb, founder and CEO of the World of Money, and I'm excited that you're here. And we believe at World of Money, a 15-year nonprofit um, organization based here in New York City, that if we're really serious about financial education, it, or financial security and generational wealth, it must proceed or begin with financial education, right? Because we, we need to know what we're doing first, right? Now, I got a question for you. When you saw the theme, the future of your money, what did you think? Well, what is the future of my money? I never thought about it <laughs> like that. So today, that is what we are. Stop laughing, Monty. That's what, <laughs> that's what um, our intention, and we would encourage you to have that same kind of intention or question to ask yourself, because if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. This is a safe space, and for the next hour and a half, hour and change, our experts who are licensed and certified financial advisors, um, they're, they they want to pour into you and share all of their wisdom, and if we don't, we run out of time, on, uh, then you can contact them directly, but it is our hope, our trust that you will hit, no matter what's going on in your life, that you will hit the reset button and begin now. So our, our experts today, their expertise uh, centers around credit, taxes, estate planning, retirement, insurance, you know, the light stuff. So, but we're going to um, share this information with you and we want it to be beyond a, an intellectual exercise that it is information that you're going to take with you and to say, okay, today, this is my plan, okay? Now, another other housekeeping, take notes, all right? Take notes and your question should be in the chat because we want to answer all of your questions. And then please answer the two uh, poll questions. What financial issue are you addressing right now? And then the other question, because this is a series of virtual town halls, um, we want to know what subject you would like for us to focus on, you know, in the future, in the very, very near future. All right. And um, let's see what else is there. Oh, so I have a question for you. What is your intention for your financial life? We address spiritual, academic, professional, and I'm not talking about your family, your financial life. What are you determined to do starting today, this moment, to move towards that financial life? What mind shift, what mind shift are you willing to take to move towards deserving or believing that you deserve to live a financially secure and philanthropic life? What does philanthropy have to do with money? Well, everything, because nothing enters a closed fist, nothing, okay? So think about that. And I trust that today that you're going to hit the reset button because if you don't do it, who will? All right. So are we ready to get started? Do, do I have any responses in the chat? Let's see. Okay. We have Rendell Solomon from Chicago. Hello, Stephanie Jupiter from Houston, Texas. We have Rodney Parther from Bergen County. Shirley Ann is from Chicago. <laughs> okay. Who else? Want to know who else is joining us and where? Okay. All right, so let's get started. First, coming to want to introduce our, our guest, our featured experts. 
So first coming to the stage is a graduate of Harvard Business School, and he has 20 years as a financial advisor and has taught world of money young moguls for over 10 years. Welcome Senior Vice President at B. Riley Wealth Management, Mr. Monty Henry. Hi, Sabrina. Am I on? We hear you. We don't see you. Okay. Hold on a second. <laughs> Turn your camera on. Great. Camera on now, Sabrina? Not yet. We hear you. Don't see you. Well, Sabrina, can you turn it on? I think you turned it off last time. Okay, let's see. Um, begin aggressive retirement planning at age 50. Um, could you talk about that? And then I have another question from Stephanie from Houston regarding retirement investments. You know, so so if the first thing I said when I started was that my mother sat me down and she had me do my own financial plan right over the years from when i started at age 22 to now i've been consistently putting aside dollars for the future so so you're able to have the value of of, of money starting young and growing to now age 50 age 60 and when, when you retire now starting later that's going to be a whole lot more money you've got to put aside so that's why when i'm sitting down having the conversation with somebody i'm saying Let's look at your day-to-day -day expenses, first of all. Let's look at that cable bill, because I guarantee the cable bill is usually the, the, the biggest thief in your house. The cable bill is usually running anywhere from $250 to $300. Your cell phone bill is running anywhere from, from, from $200 to $250. So my point is, look at your current expenses and try and cut them down so that you have more money saving for your retirement. Now, yes, I hear the question. I'm starting at 50 to save for my retirement. You see, you, you can't be too aggressive because look at the market. We just had this huge drop in the market. So you're putting money in. The benefit is that you're buying everything on sale, but you don't want to be too aggressive because if you're going to retire soon, it's about being right in that moderate space, Sabrina. You don't want to be too aggressive because when the market goes down, you're going to panic. So it's about having the conversation and finding that sweet spot of what makes sense for you. <clears throat> Aggressive or, or more conservative to moderate. It's find that happy medium. And then uh, Stephanie from, and this may be also a question for Monty, uh, can you make suggestions for retirement investments currently just, she's just in a Roth IRA and other mutual funds, emergency prepared savings in a high yield savings account. You know, but the key part is she said she's not retired. She's not retired. She's not retired. Um, Stephanie, could you reply to that? Are you retired? So, so, so let me let me answer it two ways. If Stephanie is retired, then being in a money market, you know, if she's in her fifties, probably a little too conservative. A money market is more for your savings, Sabrina. Whereas you want to be in the market if you're in your fifties to make sure that you have the value of earning some additional dollars, which right now the intent is buying low because the market is down. So when the market comes back, you have the opportunity to really gain on your investments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions, uh, attendees, co-hosts? Do you have any other questions for she's your, Stephanie Lillian? said she's 49. So I answered it okay. appropriately. Okay. So, so Stephanie, by you being 49, the idea is be in the market, you know, have that money market be your savings account money. So just in case, and ideally you want to have anywhere from six to 12 months of money in your savings account, just in case. So how much is enough life insurance? And there's a difference between life insurance and whole insurance and term yes. insurance. Yes. Why, why, why life insurance? So, so I, I will say this to you, the amount of life insurance or the kind of life insurance, on the day of death, the mortician is not going to ask you, was it a term insurance policy or was it a whole life insurance policy? <laughs> the key is at the date of death, you need to have some life insurance in place. 
So that handsome man that you saw before my daddy, you know, part of my parents' plan when we were younger was my father and mother said, we have to have a lot of life insurance because if anything were to happen to either one of them, let's make sure that my wife, my mother, would not have to compromise herself to raise his three kids. So term insurance allows you to get a lot of coverage for a small amount of premium. So when you see that screen, I'm intentional in showing you these rates are term insurance rates, Sabrina. And I'm pointing out that here is age 55, half a million dollars of coverage, male $78 per month or female $61 per month. Now, the truth of it is, depending on your health, so if we're a little fluffy, you know, that sounds better than saying fat. If we're a little fluffy or we have high blood pressure, cholesterol, so your health conditions will absolutely dictate the premiums you're going to pay. And so too, just like I told you with my father having cancer, for him trying to qualify for life insurance right now, he would not be able to qualify. So that's why, again, it makes sense to buy these insurances when you're in good health. Because, you know, you want these policies to be there when something happens. And you want to do it when you're younger and you're in good health. So I would much rather, to answer that question, you said term insurance or whole life insurance, I'd rather see you with a lot of coverage. You know, a million dollars for your family will do a whole lot more than 25000 of whole life insurance. That's the way you have to look at it. What does your family need in the event of, of death? Younger kids, let's do a lot of term insurance. When you get older, we can start converting over to whole life insurance because there are benefits for whole life insurance. The key is the premium is going to be more per month. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So these are? The, I, I would call these sort of the basic financial essentials, Serena, where, you know, the savings account, health insurance, disability insurance, auto home insurance, life insurance, long-term care. So, so, you know, when people think of finances as a set it and forget it, it is not that. There's always that next level of financial conversations you need to have. Does it mean that we need to add more money towards savings? Does it mean that we need to do more life insurance? Is now the time for long-term care insurance? So there's always that next level of financial conversation that you have to have it, have to have. It's like going for your dental checkup or your annual physical. It's a requirement that you should be more prudent. Don't stick your head in the sand and think it's just going to go away. Be more cognizant of your dollars, especially now, based on the way the economy is at. I was under the impression under Obamacare that there were no pre-health uh, requirements in order to get, okay. To, to get health insurance. That's right. Exactly right. The new administration is trying to change things, but that's another story. But, um, you know, the reality is, yes, you're able to get health insurance. And so buying it through the marketplace is good. You know, getting it through your employer is even better. The cost is lower. So all of these things, you know, it's, you know, my role, my, my, my job is to show you everything that you need to have. Mm -hmm. From there, we figure out what's financially comfortable mm -hmm. and we start adding on as time goes on. I don't do, you have, do you have to be in a certain, in quote unquote, good health for life insurance, whole or term insurance, or just, uh, do they waive that requirement? No, not for life. So, so when you're going through a life insurance underwriting process, we do look at your health. We do look at, you know, your, your pre-existing conditions. The health insurance is the one where they don't look at that to qualify for health insurance, Sabrina. So that's the difference. Okay. Right. They don't want you to. Okay. Got it. I think, I yes. think we all get that. Um, and then, and then I'm going, we have a question from Maritza. Tell us about this slide. You know, I, I, I use this slide because I want you to always keep revisiting. So that's like what I said before, you know, it's not about setting it and forgetting it. You have to keep track of your spending. Tra so, you know, I sat down with a, a client of mine recently and I had them look at their spending, Sabrina, in January and in February. And when they saw just how much frivolous spending they were doing, because now we've all been sort of, you know, sheltering in place. And we've not been spending and not eating out as much. So I'm having them look at these two different spending habits. And I'm asking you to say to yourself, where have you been overindulgent? And that's the extra money I want you to put aside. Because the truth of it, we don't know how long the situation is going to go. 
we don't know where your employer is going to be. A lot of people have been getting furloughed. So there's a lot of things happening. So it makes a lot of sense to have a lot of cash on hand. So that's why I'm suggesting to my clients, shift that money from the spending bucket into your savings. Because the more financially confident you are, is the more, the more you will feel that you're not in this panic state. And that's where I go with managing the debt. Reach out to your creditors. Ask for a lower interest rate. Ask for whatever deferment programs that you have, student loans, other, other things of that nature. Curb your income spending, folks. Find ways to save more. And, and I put the last one there very intentionally, and this speaks to everything that you do, Sabrina, is that we have to loop our kids into these conversations. You know, us kids, our kids are seeing us use credit cards, you know, just thinking, well, just use your plastic, mommy, use your credit card. What's the big deal? Yes, it is a wonderful thing to have good credit, as, as, as Daryl will go into more. But you have to explain to them that just this constant want, you, you have to curb that. So what did you earn? You have to earn the right to something new. You have to earn the right to, to us going out to eat. So all these things, make sure your kids are aware of money because you don't want them to, to have the same habits that you are living with right now. If they're good habits, then that's wonderful. If they're bad habits, you've got to break them now. So no more Black Friday? No more Black Friday, Sabrina. No more, no more, no more. Yes, we have to be good. Okay, so um, Len, she says in late 50s, isn't whole life, um, in the late, an age late 50s, isn't whole life too much? And Stephanie, um, she says, I'm a little nervous about the stock market, especially with the lows right now. I do not plan to take out. I understand it's a long time investment. I have yes. a curiosity about real, uh, real estate investments. Is that a great retirement investment in addition to stock market? And then our um, Monty and our other experts can address those questions as well. Sure. So, so let me start with, hey, come on. Um, with the stock market question, you know? So, or, or, or if you were to go out to the store right now, is it better to buy something on sale or full price? On sale, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, the market is on sale. So if you have the extra dollars to be able to put a little bit more into your 401k on a monthly basis, I would say absolutely do that because you're buying everything on sale. Think about the toilet paper. You know, in December, toilet paper was $10 a case. Now, toilet paper is $20 a case. So if you had bought a whole lot of stocks in, stock, in toilet paper, your money just went up based on that one shift with people buying so much toilet paper. So I'm, I'm saying all that to say this, that you have to look at the fact that where you are, always be comfortable to put your money into the market and don't panic based on the market going down. That's emotional investing. And I try and walk my clients away from being an emotional investor. The key is put aside dollars that you can deal with the ups and downs. If you are retiring tomorrow, you would not have been investing in an aggressive investment. You'd have been in something more conservative. So if you're 49, like, like Stephanie is, you've got time to regain the loss that you had. The other question about term insurance or whole life insurance, you see, look at term insurance, you're renting insurance from the insurance company. So I'm okay with you buying some term insurance, but at some point, the term insurance is gonna to come to an end because term insurance is either 10 years, 15, 20, or 30. So what happens when the term insurance ends? That's why I say together, term and whole life is the right fit for your financial portfolio so that you've got a whole life policy that runs for your whole life. So together, they're, they're working to help you for the maximum future. Okay, Shirley, and you're going to come back with the round table with other, yeah. the other experts at the end. But for right now, and then you can repeat that at the end, Three action steps everyone must do right now. First one I will say, then you add the other three, um, and then we're coming to you, Sandra, thank you, is um, definitely get a financial board of directors. Get a financial board of directors. People who are experts in this, in this field um, or seasoned, certified, and licensed that can be your support and that can remove and eradicate the feelings of anxiety, anxiety and fear. Yes. Three uh, action points, Shirley so, so the three, the first one is review your current spending. Spending today and spending a few months ago. That's really key, review your current spending. 
make the call to your creditors to try and negotiate better rates. Absolutely. <clears throat> and then, and then number three is have a conversation with somebody like me. Stop, stop. You, you, you cannot do brain surgery on your own. So hire somebody who can help you through this. So those are the three things I would say. Start with looking at where you are spending. Make the calls. Don't stick your head in the sand. Open your envelopes. Because so many people, Sabrina, are not opening their envelopes. And then three. <laughs> And at the end of the day, just like Sabrina said, that board of advisors helps you navigate through these turbulent times right now. Mm -hmm. And Sandra, I know you raised your hand. I'm just trying to find it. Could you put the, would you put your question in the chat, please? And anyone have any additional questions or questions at any point, please put them in the chat so we can answer them. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Shirley Ann. We'll see you at the end where we come back with everyone else. Thank you for being so brilliant. <laughs> Okay, coming next to the virtual stage is the tax junkie all the way from the state of Florida. She's an expert in not only taxes, but estate planning, um, contract issues, consumer protection, uh, graduated from a master's of law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center. Please welcome attorney Jamie Coleman. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Yes. So let me just get there. Um, here we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about, can you see that? Um, not yet. Okay. Well, that's probably my bad. Let's see. I'll just fail to start. Let's try again. We can share. Hmm. Okay, let me. Um, okay. Jamie, I will share it. You share it? Okay, cool. Yeah, I already have it open. Okay. Uno momento. You're going to share from your screen. Yes, there you go. Okay, cool. All right. So let's, um, let's start the slideshow. I want to talk to you guys about death and taxes. Um, there's an old I, thing. Before you get into it, into it, Jamie, mm -hmm. one of the most annoying parts of life is when a loved one makes a transition and we want to resolve all of the state uh, intestate trust will probate court issues at the funeral <laughs> isn't that a little too late ah uh, yeah it is a little too late it's a little Thank too you. late to to plan for that person's death but it does get you start it starts to get you thinking about goodness you know all of this that i'm going through i should probably plan for my situation. And that's a, that's a, that's a thing. People were just kind of squirrely about planning for their own situations, mostly because they think it's morbid. They think it means they're manifesting their death. And, and I want to just try to shed a different perspective. A state planning or having a plan doesn't have to be morbid. Um, it can, it's actually planning for not just your life but the lives of your loved ones and so if we can think about it in those terms instead of the grim reaper coming to take you then i think we'll get a little bit ahead especially as a community a black community we oftentimes avoid having those conversations um because grandma said you know you're not supposed to talk about these things but um i want to just you know just go through one of our misconceptions that people have is that you have to be wealthy in order to have a plan. You know, I, I was telling a, a new lawyer, like, hey, let me do your estate plan for you. And she was like, I don't own anything. And, um, and you know, that's just simply not true. If you have a bank account, you should do a, an estate plan. If you um, are living, you should do an estate plan. Um, and why um, I recently had a, the privilege of, um, well, like a, a year or so ago, maybe two years, I worked with another law firm. Um, they were doing a wrongful death case, a young man 
man was killed outside of his uh, mother's apartment complex. And he, um, at the time, we didn't know whether he had a child or not. Um, and so he wasn't married um, and we weren't sure if he had children. We knew that he had parents. Um, and so in Florida, uh, and I'm a Florida lawyer, in Florida, if you have no children, you're not married, you have no children, everything that you are supposed to inherit or your assets go up to your parents. Um, this was not this young man's situation, but what if you have a parent that's been absent? You know, what if his mother or his father had been absent? You know, that parent would have stand to inherit half of a million dollars, just to throw out a number. And is that what you want, you know? Or um, what if you want to disinherit a child? You know, um, these are some considerations um, that you, you should think about and, um, and, and why everybody should have a plan. Um, so the basics, and if we could go to, to slide three, which is labeled slide two. Sorry, it's labeled types. So everyone needs an estate plan. So the estate plan is going to, a, a general estate plan is going to consist of four main documents. So only one of those documents deal with um, death. The first one is your last will and testament, and it'll have some consideration about a trust um, in there. The other three documents are about your life. The will is the only thing that deals with your death. And the other three documents is the durable power of attorney. That's probably the most um, powerful document out of all documents in your estate plan. I'll get to that a little later. The next document is your healthcare surrogate. That's when you designate someone to make medical decisions for you. And the last document is what we call the living will. That's um, some considerations that I ask people to make. If you find yourself in a permanent vegetative state, do you want life prolonging procedures? Sometimes when you go to the hospital, they have these forms called five wishes. Um, that type of information is in that form called five wishes. Um, Sabrina, if we can move to the next slide. So um, number three, I wanna show number three if I can. So this is, to me, this is so beautiful. I want you guys to know this is how I want to have my weight, okay? I want to be in a glass casket like Snow White, and I want the viewing to be in a beautiful <laughs> garden like this. That requires some planning. It also requires some money. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, I want to show you this. This is one of my uh, the little, little personal the video is not enabled. Okay, so when you click in the middle, yeah, can you double click. Wait a minute, maybe something's happening. Oh, okay. all right, there it goes. Yep. And we're gonna we're gonna play up to a minute twenty five. So uh, I want to show you this video. It's unavailable. Oh. Great, and I can't share my screen. Okay, so some some hum, homework that I want to give you um, a little personal tidbit about me. I love um, old movies, really old movies. And one of the movies um, that I wanted to show you today, a little clip from it, is called Imitation of Life. Mm. And for those that may not um, know about that movie, that's your homework. I want you to go check it out, specifically the funeral scene. And the funeral is elaborate. It is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Mahalia Jackson is singing at Annie's funeral. Um, there's thousands of people lining the street. She's in a horse drawn, her casket's in a, in a horse drawn carriage. There are like four, maybe six white horses. Um, a very elaborate, beautiful funeral. The average funeral right now costs upwards of $10,000 or so, I'm sure that funeral is well over, you know, $50,000. Um, that's why planning is important. You know, you, you don't want to put your family in a position where they can't afford to bury you. Um, you don't want to put them in a position where they can't afford, they have to do uh, fish fries or GoFundMe's to <laughs> give you just the average funeral, okay? The average, just a mahogany casket, 
you know, now with coronavirus, they're all grave site pretty much, you know, $10,000, no more GoFundMes for funerals, okay? We've got financial advisors here that can talk to you about life insurance. You heard from Shirley Ann. Um, but that's why planning becomes important. And so I wanna provide some basic tips for you um, to, to do additional homework for you to do, um, free advice only right now, okay? Um, for you so you can plan. So we talked about the last will and testament. When you do your will, I want you to think about how do you want to be buried, okay? I want, to think, I want you to, do you want to be cremated? Do you want your ashes to be scattered along some beautiful beach or the Gulf of Mexico? Um, think about that. Um, do, do you have like some religious rituals or tenets that you want to um, make sure are present? Um, that's your opportunity to put that in your, it, to make it, express it and, and put it in your will. I also want you to think about who should be the personal representative. That's the person that's going to effectuate your wishes after you're dead, right? After you've passed. They're going to make sure your things go to the people that you want them to go or the places that you want them to go. Um, I want you to think about who should be the successor in case that personal representative is uncomfortable or maybe they've already passed or maybe they're nowhere to be found. Um, who should be the backup plan? Those are some things I want you to think about when it comes to your will. The next document I, I said earlier was the most powerful document. This person you wanna make sure can, you can trust implicitly. They stand in your shoes, they act just like you and they can either help you a lot or harm you a great deal. And that's your durable power of attorney. Um, why this is important is because if you find yourself some years down the line and you don't know who the president is, you don't know what day it is, you don't know what's going on around you, maybe it's Alzheimer's, maybe it's dementia, maybe it's some really severe memory loss, you can't take care of your financial situation, then you may have to have a guardian appointed. And that's a very expensive process. It's a necessary process for those that don't have someone they trust implicitly, but it is expensive and it's a process. Whereas if you right now, while you're healthy, while you're of sound mind and body, can appoint someone to act on your behalf that you trust will take care of your finances the way you want them to be taken care of, they're gonna be prudent, they're gonna be conservative, um, then you should do a power of attorney. And um, that's really, I've seen the worst of these forms used, but I've also seen the best of, of, of people using them correctly. Um, so you really wanna make sure you trust them implicitly. I can't stress that enough. The next document is a healthcare surrogate. That's who makes medical decisions for you. Um, not necessarily life or death, but they do make medical decisions with the help of a, a physician, right? And so I keep the power of attorney and the healthcare surrogate forms separate um, because sometimes the person that can make legal and medical decisions, legal decisions or financial decisions may not be the same person that you want to make medical decisions for you. Um, you can always combine them, but I just keep the documents separate and that's why I have them outlined that way. The last document that I can include in a living, in a state plan is a living will. And that document is, hey, I'm in a permanent vegetative state. There's no brain activity going on. Do I want food, water, and medicine? Um, for some, it's just a, most people, it's a personal preference. I get people that say, I do want food, water, and medicine. I get people say, nope, just let me go. I get people that say, hey, keep me alive for six weeks. And if nothing happens, just let me go. Um, this is not a decision you want family members to make. And I'll just share a little personal story as to why my aunt died maybe six, seven years ago. And before she passed, she had um, went into a, a vegetative state and the physician said, oh, she's not coming out. And about a week or two went by and she came out. So, right, like the power of God, like it was just amazing. She came out. The next time she went into a vegetative state, um, the, the same, same uh, you know, diagnosis, she's not coming out of that. And so you had her boyfriend on one side of her hospital bed saying, you know, it's, it's time to let her go. You had her children on the other side of the bed saying, no, mom, we, we, we can't let mom go yet. 
you had her siblings at the end or the foot of the bed fighting amongst each other. Now, six years later, the family is disconnected because of that, because there's a lot of blame. There's a lot of guilt, you know, and that's why I say planning doesn't have to be morbid. If you could think about it in terms of I'm planning for my loved ones, do you want them to be fighting over your hospital bed? I think we can all um, relate to that story in a little bit. I think we all know of stories like that. Um, so you need to have these difficult decisions, um, uh, conversations, and you need to be making your way towards these decisions. I wanna move on to the next slide regarding assets. When you do an estate plan, you're also thinking about your assets. You're thinking about your home, you're thinking about other real property you own, um, maybe at your condo or rental property. You're thinking about your investment accounts, your pension, your retirement. You're thinking about your bank accounts. The other thing I want you to consider is now, who are the beneficiaries of those accounts? I had a young man who passed unexpectedly, 35 years old, um, no children, no wife, you know, no life insurance. He had $75,000 in his bank account. His mother had to do fish fries at the church to raise funds to get a lawyer, okay? And in Florida, an average lawyer is gonna cost $2,500 to $3,000 uh, $3, just to hire them, not to do the work, but just to hire them. And um, just so they can file paperwork to get to the $75,000 so that they could bury him. Of course, they had to bury him first. So that was, you know, upwards of $6,000. Then they had to raise more money to get a lawyer so that they can get the $75,000. Here's some free advice, okay? If you have a bank account, go and add payable on death beneficiary designations to your bank account. Name somebody that you love and trust to get that bank account. And all they will, ever, all they will have to do is take $10, get your death certificate and their ID and go and retrieve the money. That's how you can cure having to spend thousands of dollars on a lawyer just to probate your bank account. But your assets are important, um, obviously, in your state plan, because if you say, I want everything to go to my three children, but your, um, in your will, but your pension account says it all goes to your ex-boyfriend, well, now your estate plan is inconsistent and you really don't have a plan. So you've got to take in consideration these assets that you own, who the beneficiaries are, and is that co consistent and does it coincide with what you want to happen? We can move on to the next one, Sabrina, thank you. So in when you're planning, you want to think about your asset protection. You want to think about how can I keep this asset for its best and optimal use during my lifetime? You want to think about what is that asset? What is the type of asset? So I'm in Florida. I'm going to give you Florida advice. If you have a homestead, um, the homestead is protected, okay? It's protected from all creditors except for the government, except from the IRS, okay? You think about um, O.J. Simpson, right? So O.J. Simpson won the criminal trial, right? But he lost the civil trial. He takes his NFL pension and he moves to Florida. He buys a home. And so the Browns could not collect on that civil judgment because his pension was protected, the type of assets, and his homestead is protected, the type of assets. So the type of assets that you own inherently have, may have their own asset protection. Think about how you own the asset. How is it titled? If you are married, you want to make sure, at least if you're in Florida, that your spouse and you own all assets together and all liabilities separate, okay? All assets together, all liabilities separate. So because you're, the way you're, if it's titled as husband and wife, that has its own asset protection. So no creditors, except for the government, can get to that asset, all right? Um, only your joint creditors can get to that asset. And so that's why you wanna keep your liabilities separate your assets together. Notice how I did not say or give an example about a car or a boat or a plane or a jet ski or any of those things being an asset. While they may have value, they become liabilities. And if you don't have adequate insurance, the person that operated those types of ass, uh, um, uh, vehicles, so to speak, 
um, and the person that owns that becomes subject to li the liability. So to me, those are considered liabilities. And I tell people own, only the person that operates the car, the boat should be the one um, that owns it. Um, I sometimes spouses, okay, my husband's driving this, but both of our names are on the car. No, if you drive the Cadillac, you need to own the Cadillac, okay? Um, and have your husband drive his pickup truck, okay? And not your Cadillac. That's whoever operates it needs to own it. Um, think about whether you have adequate insurance, okay? So if you have a rental property, um, they don't typically have their own asset protection unless you have, but you, but you can ensure that it is protected if you have proper insurance, if you maybe have it in an LLC, if you have it in a family limited partnership, if you can um, have sufficient insurance or you title it correctly, you can protect that asset that could turn into a liability from your other assets. So just to sum up estate planning, it's an ongoing process. Um, the free advice that I gave you, and I'm on to the next slide, Sabrina, I'm sorry. The free advice that I gave you is go put on payable death beneficiary designations as your bank account. That's something we can all do. And also go find an estate planner that you trust. You know, you can always go to somebody you um, that a, a friend refers you to. Um, but start that process. Start thinking about it. I mean, it's no coincidence that we're all here today and that I'm having this discussion with you. So um, we're not calling on death door or anything like that. I just want you to start planning. So now we're on to something even sexier, taxes. Right, and we, we do have some um, questions. Um, uh, Kareen Francis asks, she's the current tax situation has left us with a huge bill that we own, owe to Uncle Sam. What can we do to avoid getting hit with a huge bill next year? And then Michelle Phipps asks, can someone create an estate plan through an online accessible form or is it required to obtain a document from a professional. And and what a homestead is is property, home. right? Your homestead is your yeah. home. It's your principal place where you live. Okay. And in most states, your homestead, and I'll get to I'll, someone just posted about LLC. I'll get to that in the tax form, the tax um, segment of my presentation. But um, it's your principal place of residency in most states, it is protected. Um, so uh, that's what I mean by homestead. And I'm a Florida-based lawyer, so I'm talking in terms of Florida law. I don't practice in any other state. If you have questions specific to your state, just send me an email. I will find the answer for you or get you to the person that can answer that for you. Um, so Zoom, uh, not Zoom, excuse me, uh, Legal Zoom, I think it's called, mm -hmm. Rocket Lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. Those are online platforms that you can do your wills on. Absolutely. You can totally use that. And I've had people, you know, I personally don't like to do it, but I, it, I have had people come to me and say, here, this is what I did on Rocket Lawyer. This is what I did on LegalZoom. Do you mind taking a look over it for me? This is what I want to accomplish with my estate plan. I'm not sure that I did that online. Um, the only reason I don't really prefer to do it is because, you know, I will inevitably see something that I really don't necessarily agree with or have questions about. And it's not my, you know, it's not my style. So I will want to change things. And it's, uh, it's, it, you know, so that, that's the only reason. But you can totally do that. And there are professionals that will review it for you. I've had clients go to lawyers to look over their own plans that they've done themselves and um, and ask questions. So absolutely, you can do that. You can create a state, an estate plan through an online platform and not you're not necessarily required to do to get a professional to deal with it. Now, in Florida, you do have to have two witnesses and a notary with your, there's some formalities. And in most states, there are some technical formalities to properly do a will, right? I can't write on a napkin in Florida and say, I want everything to go to, you know, all my children and then just sign it. You know, while it may be um, something that be, can be presented to the court, if, it, if, 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 if anything's ever challenged, it's not a will um, because it, it's not executed with the proper legal formalities. Um, and so that's why consulting with a professional is advisable. Um, um, Jamie, really important, the point that you just made, everything that you just said, um, 
when you don't have properly ex executed documents or zero documents, your options for your life, your decisions for your life can be made by some an entity at probate court, people who don't even know you. And so do you want people who don't even know you making decisions about maybe you didn't want aunt so-and-so to have the pearls or the bank account? And then right. she shows up and says, you were her favorite and you weren't, you know what I mean? Right. So, and then the other thing is too, is a lot of African-Americans or people in general are dying intestate. So uh, this foreign entity has to make the decision, but there's a huge difference between wills and trusts as it yep. relates to probate court. Could you just, just a very short, briefly, just talk about that? Um, I know you want to talk about taxes, but please. No, we'll talk about trust um, for a little bit. There are several different types of trust, okay? And just back to your point, I always tell people, you have a will, whether you created one or not. If you don't create the plan that you want, the state has created one for you. So I have right now a client who's married. He's trying to get a divorce. I pray he does not pass because everything he has will automatically go to his wife um, that he's trying to get a divorce from and he's not, you know, acting on his estate plan fast enough. So if you don't have an estate plan, trust and believe the government has one for you, okay? And those assets that you had intended on leaving to your loved ones could be depressed or decline a little um, because now they're being spent litigating or starting administration. So is that the best use of the things that you've worked so hard for? Or hard for maybe you want to transfer your assets to a charity. Right, right. Is, maybe that's right. your will. Right, yeah. and, that, and that happens all the time. That happens all the time. I think, so in terms of trust, there's several different types of trust. Now, most wills will have what we call a standby trust in them. That's, if, if that's, a trust that says, in the event that something of my estate goes to someone under age or under disability, it's going to be held by the personal representative in trust until they recover from their disability or they reach age, okay? So most wills have that type of provision in it. But when, when we talk about trust, we're not really talking about standby trust. We're talking about revocable and irrevocable and living trust. Um, those documents um, are not the same. They're different. Irrevocable means that you cannot amend it. Like, so if I were to create a trust, I would be called um, the test, the grantor of the trust. And if I were to create a trust and it's irrevocable, I cannot amend it, okay? Um, unless by court order or consent to all the beneficiaries of the trust. It's a process. Uh, revocable means I can amend it and you can do both of those types of trust during your lifetime, or you can have all your assets poured into it and it gets created at your death. And then you have what are called living trust. And a lot of people like to say, okay, living trust will help you avoid probate. And they absolutely do. But this is why getting with a professional is so important because you may not need a living trust. You may spend $1,500 to create one, but may not necessarily need it. So I'll give you an example. I had an, an older woman, um, no, no, um, she just had one child and she um, um, had only her home and her bank account. That's all that she owns. And she was in the last quarter of her life. And so she told me, oh yeah, I, honey, I got my state plan together. I got a living trust. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's great. Yeah, I'm not gonna have to, pro it's not, nothing's gonna have to be probated. Um, and so we just started and I was like, okay, that's fine. I was like, so your home is titled in the living trust. And she was like, yes, ma'am. And I said, okay, I bet your property taxes are pretty expensive then, right? Like, and she's like, yeah, they are. And that's because the, tr the trust now owns her home and not an individual. And so had she had just a little bit more guidance, she could have did an enhanced life estate deed where she gets the property, stays in her name. So now she can have lower property taxes because it's owned by her and, her and she lives there. And then at her death, it goes to her child. That takes care of that. So we don't need a living trust. You know, you didn't have to pay $1,500. You could have paid $100 to do that deed. And you could do whatever you want with that house. You could sell it, whatever. But if you still own it, it goes to your child 
automatically. All they have to do is give a death certificate to the property appraiser's website. And then her bank account, well, you guys know what that is. That advice is put it payable on death beneficiary. So when, when you're planning and if you get with a professional, you know, uh, some professionals do want to sell you a product. I'm just not one of those. Um, but you want to make sure you get in somebody that's proficient and that that knows that that's planning for you and not necessarily trying to sell you a product. Um, living trusts are great. I'm not talking bad about them. I'm just saying that planning requires more. It's not a one size fits all type deal. Um, so that's trust. Do we have another question? Oh, I said the free advice is you got a bank account, go put a payable on death beneficiary on your bank account, okay? If you're banking with Wells or Bank of America, or wherever you're banking, put a beneficiary designation on it. That's going to avoid having that account probated. I have people who that have passed, they only have $2,500 in their bank account. And, you know, the question for their family members is, does it really make sense for me to spend $2,500 on you just so I can get $2,500? It's a hard decision. Um, so you can avoid them from having to ever have to think about that if you just put a payable on death beneficiary on your bank account. Just like you do beneficiaries on your life insurance policies, you can do that on your bank account. Let's go on to taxes and the question regarding the LLC, let's reserve for the round table. Cool. Taxes. Okay, so taxes is super sexy. I don't, you know, I love this stuff. I'm a, a junkie. Uh, um, what I what I do mostly with taxes is problem solving. Um, but I wanted to give you some some advice. Some of the common issues that I see with people um, with their tax problems is they are not uh, working with someone that's competent or certified or licensed um, to do that. Right. Um, so get a certified or licensed professional first and foremost. I have had people come to me and they have filed incorrectly. My married couple, couples um, will file head of household and they're both living together. They've got kids, one, one parent's claiming this child, one parent's claiming that child. And um, if you had a, a professional advising you about it, yes, it doesn't cost a little bit more, but it's worth it because once you get audited, okay, by the IRS, you then now have to pay back all of those refunds that you got because husband filed head of household and you filed head of household, um, wife filed head of household. Married people generally can only file married jointly or married separate. There are some exceptions to that, but you won't know the exceptions unless you study the code really well or you talk to a professional that's competent. Um, another issue that I see a lot is people procrastinate. They wait till the very last moment to do their taxes. Um, some goal that I, a goal that I like to try to tell people is, you know, pay enough into the system that you're not getting a refund. Once you reach a certain income threshold, pay enough that you're using your money the way you want to use it um, throughout the year. And, and but that you don't end up owing at the end of the year, okay? So a lot of people, oh yeah, I'm, I'm happy about getting a refund. I'm happy if I don't owe. That's when I'm happy, okay? That's, if I don't owe, I'm good because I can spend my money the way I want to and the government not doesn't have control over how I spend my money. Also, I um, so I can get to use more of my money throughout the year but also nobody really wants to owe the government either. And so, cause with that comes interest and penalties. So you end up owing more, but um, your goal should be what I would like for you to strive for as we think about the future of our money is not necessarily, I want to get money back, but I want to keep my money as, as much as I can um, throughout the year and use it the way I want to use it and not owe the government, right? Um, and lastly, um, treat yourself like a business in a world of bosses, right? We're all bosses. We're all entrepreneurs. Uh, there, we're not handling our ourselves or our personal finances like a business. So keep track of your spending. Keep track of your um, expenses. If you are an entrepreneur or a solo practitioner, and we'll get into that, you know. Keep track of what you spend on your business expenses. Keep it separate. Try not to co-mingle. 
Um, but treat yourself like a business. I, I ask people to, you know, to set a date every year that they're going to go through their records. If they can't do it every quarter, just do it every anniversary. I have one client on President's Day, which is the day that most people have off sometimes. Um, he, he meets with his tax professional and they go over what he needs for the upcoming year or the upcoming filing system. You know, whatever it is, January 1st or September 15th, pick a day and schedule that day. That's the day I'm going to deal with my taxes. Nothing else is going on but my taxes. Um, so corporate structures. Let's move on to corporate structures. So what I help both individuals and businesses. Um, and I one of the one of the issues that people have about filing taxes especially in a world of bosses is um, how am I structured? What should I be filing? So if you are a corporation, there's two types. There's an S corp and there's a C corp. An S corp is going to file a form 1120S. They are a pass-through entity, which means the corporation itself pays no taxes. That's an S corp, okay? Um, the shareholders of the corporation pays the taxes and they pay taxes at their respective marginal tax bracket, whatever that is, okay? A C-Corp, however, is going to file a Form 1120, and they are going to pay federal corporate taxes, okay? They're also probably going to pay state corporate taxes, and those members or shareholders will also pay taxes. So there's a three-tier taxation with the C-Corp versus an S-Corp, okay? Sole proprietors are Schedule Cs, they file on their own personal tax returns, and there's a specific form called a Schedule C form where all their activity goes on that form, okay? So sole proprietor. Partnerships, um, they're going to file a form 1065. Now, notice in this conversation, I said nothing about an LLC. Many times when I ask people, um, when people talk to me about their businesses, and they're like, you know, and I ask them, well, how are you taxed? Oh, I'm an LLC. Well, an LLC is not a taxable entity. It is a state creation, a limited liability company that helps to absolve you personally from liability. LLCs can, are taxed and can be taxed in any one of these three ways that we just talked about, okay? You can find them on your Schedule C. You can do, um, an escort can be an LLC. So, you know, Next time somebody asks you how you're taxed, don't say LLC. You know, endeavor to find out whether you're S Corp, you're a sole proprietor, or you're a partnership. And um, Jamie, there was yeah. a question um, from Rodney. Uh, can you put a beneficiary designation on other types of accounts that hold cash, like a brokerage account? Just uh, take a, a, about 30 seconds to answer, yeah. and then we need to move on. You're coming back at the okay. end. Yeah. yeah, so it depends. All questions. Right, it depends. If your brokerage account allows you to do payable on death beneficiaries, great, awesome. Most of them, they're, some of them are not hip to that just yet. Um, it's a little bit more administrative work for them. So um, that's why having a will is an important um, tool in making sure that those stocks get passed down the way you want to. Um, but it just depends. It depends on the company. Not all companies allow you to do that. Great question, though. Okay, so you can, this is how you can contact me. So thanks, Sabrina. Thank you so much. A round of applause for Jamie Coleman Esquire. Ooh. <laughs> okay, great. So next, coming to the virtual stage. Everyone wants to talk about the markets. Are we in recession? Are we not in recession? What do we do with our money? How can we make a million dollars in one day? Well, here to answer that right now is the senior vice president from B. Riley Investments. He's taught at World of Money probably since day one. Thank you so much. No, I've been a while, Chip. It's been a minute. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, so this market is a lot of people have a lot of anxiety, anxieties to it. Um, the word depression is being floated out there, recession. How do we know if we're in a recession or depression and what should we do about it today? 
Well, Sabrina, I mean, there's an old joke on Wall Street. You know, when your neighbor loses his or her job, it's a recession. When you lose your job, it's a depression. Um, I would argue that there is a fairly high level of shock and, and paralysis on the part of a lot of investors on just average people, because we've really never seen a situation where the economy shut down intentionally for such a long period. Uh, I, I tough to give advice without knowing everyone's particular situation. I would argue there are a couple of things we can all do. Um, Shirley Ann made a great point, which is really look very closely at your spending level um, and try to maximize the amount of capital or liquidity you have at this moment. Um, so the extent to which you owe less, uh, you have a little more flexibility if less money is coming into your household. If you're fortunate enough to have uh, very little debt and still having money coming in, try to put it away in a sensible kind of fashion. But sensible varies. You know, a 25-year-old who is living at home and makes $50,000 might have a totally different situation than someone who makes four times as much but has kids in private school and a big mortgage, et cetera. So I, I think the whole key here is really take a minute, think quietly, either with yourself or with someone you trust, about where your financial situation is, and then try to take steps one by one in terms of saving, in terms of liquidity, uh, and in terms of what assets you may have to liquidate, you know, going forward, or the assets that you think are most important and, and negotiate on how to keep them. What questions should any of our attendees ask themselves before making an, an investment? Should they go towards a mutual fund or they have liquidity, they have savings, minimum debt, or just a little bit of debt, but they want okay. to be able to accelerate the returns on their investment. What questions should they ask themselves to accept to to say, I'm going to I'm going to invest money in this particular company stock, or I'm going to invest in a pool of, of companies through a mutual fund or both? Tough situation, tough, tough question, Sabrina. Um, you know, if you're buying individual companies, there's some level of analysis you've got to do. And I used to be an analyst before I came to this job. So you've got to really understand a balance sheet and income statement. Uh, you've got to know about the uh, competitive position of that particular firm. If you're not able to really do that level of analysis, and probably 90% of the population really is not, then a mutual fund might be a better alternative. There you're turning over your, your stock selection on a buy and sell side to a manager, you know, but there are going to be higher expenses there. The manager's got to get paid. The firm's got to get paid. Um, and you have no control whatsoever over what's purchased. You may be able to look at the type of investments that the manager's buying based on his or her mandate, but you cannot control what securities he or, her, he or she buys, nor the timing thereof. Um, so I, I, it's hard for me to give you advice. I don't want to be vague, but I just don't want to give advice to, to a huge you know, population of, of individuals you have in the audience. And folks take that home and act on it because it would be irresponsible on my part. Educationally, what should what action points do you want for our our attendees to have, our co-hosts to have? What do you want well, them now, to do now? Well, that I love. That, yeah, I think the biggest investment, the best investment you can possibly make is is in yourself and in education. Um, I try to spend two to two and a half hours a day reading, and I read everything from Fox News all the way on the right over to NPR on the left. I want to know the whole spectrum because no one has it right completely, but different organizations and individuals have a good viewpoint. Uh, I think there are some folks who are doing a really, really good job on financial education outside of uh, Wall Street. Robert Kiyosaki is doing some wonderful work still on the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. I think it's been really well done. Uh, I think if you really want to look at a very sophisticated overview of where the economy is going, Jim Rickards is doing some amazing work there as well. Uh, but these books, these are books, these are books, these are podcasts, these are, uh, um, you know, programs that are available to someone. I, I cook a lot. So on a Sunday afternoon, while I'm cooking, I'm going to, I'm not listening to the Kardashians. I have no interest in that. I'm turning on a podcast to hear what some of these thinkers are seeing in terms of where the market's going, where the economy's going. And then I'm sitting down quietly over a glass of beer or two and thinking, okay, of what they're telling me and what I'm seeing, when I tend to see a fair amount doing what I do for a living, what choices can I make that are really good? So your, all of our participants 
should really take on, I think, the responsibility. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. But it's what you work for. If you think about the fact that most of us put 40 or 50 hours into work a week, maybe sometimes more, plus the commute, all of that time and effort, though you probably enjoy what you do, hopefully, is to make a living. So, you know, why would you not spend at least an hour or two every week trying to, one, participate with others who are like-minded, two, uh, I think as both of your prior panelists had suggested, find yourself, a, a, I think you used the word, Sabrina, a financial board of directors. That's a fantastic idea. You know, get folks around you if you don't want to do the work who have done the work and keep in touch with them. Pay a couple of dollars, maybe. You pay a consulting fee or an advisory fee, et cetera, but let someone who's thinking about these topics on a regular basis be an advisor to you as you and your family or you and yourself or you and your um, significant other, however your family structured, even if it's just you by yourself, think about, let's bring in individuals who are thinking about how to manage your money. And then, you know, to, to quote my man Snoop Dogg, you keep your mind on your money and your money on your mind. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, Monty, how do we, because unfortunately in this space, there are a lot of people that pop up to say, I'm a financial advisor and they're not licensed or certified. That's right. Please give the wisdom on how our, our community, everyone that's on this call and listening, how do how do you research who your who your financial advisor is outside of them telling you and have a great YouTube following? Sure, um, I, I think there are two steps, Sabrina. One, there are going to be a lot of folks who don't need a financial advisor, who don't want one. You know, I like working with my hands, so there's certain things around my house I would not pay someone to do. I can simply do it myself. I have other clients who, if they picked up a circular saw, would cut off their arm, so they really need to bring in a professional. If you're a do-it-yourself do person, there's a huge amount of information available from every major firm. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm talking about all the way from Fidelities and Vanguards, the B. Riley, Merrill's, Morgan Stanley. Everyone has a gigantic amount of free information on their website about how you can think about various aspects of your financial life. And if you're comfortable doing it on your own in that fashion, fantastic. So I'm not going to say to you everyone needs a financial advisor because one, they don't, and Two, they probably, not everyone can afford that person, nor will the engagement being positive for both the advisor and the individual. For those people who do, and you don't know someone, I mean, the first step I would do is ask someone who has money. You know, there are people around you. There's always that rich uncle or aunt that's done really well or manager that you work with who you know or have, or have told you has, has done a good job in terms of managing the investments and the assets they have. So I would ask that person, listen, can you give me a recommendation, just like you would on a doctor or, or an architect or someone to work on your home or a handyman, right? You'd ask for recommendation. Can anybody tell me who has money, who do you work with? Can you give me someone that I can speak to? And then be willing to, once again, invest time. You have to be very comfortable with that person. Um, my clients who I've, I've worked with, in some cases, 30 years. I know the kids. I, I walk into the house. The kids are like, hey, Uncle Monty, what's going on? So we've been working that long. When the parents die, the kids become my clients. Right. In our business, probably 75% to 80% of our client, of our advisors, lose either a relationship when the husband dies, because he's the financial person in the household, and he hasn't managed any relationship with the wife. Or when the parents die, the kids don't know that person, so the assets go away. In my case, it's just the opposite. I keep 90, 95% of them because I engage the wife, I engage the husband, and I engage the kid. So to the extent to which you're in a relationship with that person, you've got to be pretty comfortable with them because you're going to be talking some truth with that advisor that really only your doctor and sometimes your accountant gets to know. So if you have to interview three or four of them, take the time and do that. If it's a $100 fee or a $50 fee or no fee, spend the money because that person, if the relationship is good, is going to be invaluable to you. If it's poor and it's weak and you're not comfortable, then you're wasting everyone's time. I think you, um, you made a really great point because often you see, particularly online, individuals that are telling people that they need to invest in fill in the blank. 
without knowing what that personal circumstances are, what their risk exactly. av availability. And a lot of people will say, well, so-and-so is on YouTube and telling me I should invest in this, and then I should. <laughs> and then when I lose the money, they're nowhere to be found, or if they're to be found, they're trying to lead me down another path. That's what a certified, licensed, responsible financial advisor does. It, that person tailors to your unique um, perspective. I would say, I mean, it, we teach at World of Money that, you know, children should start to think about not only saving, but also investing, mutual funds, stock markets, a real estate, or understanding that, that they should have a portfolio, definitely insurance, but then how and what they invest in is unique to their particular um, circumstances. We have a question, um, what is the best banking institution to do business with if you get a windfall? I would say, again, it goes back to the financial education. There is a website we have zero relationship with called bankrate.com. There's probably others that you can insert your zip code and determine which bank in your locale will pay you a higher interest rate, for example, on your savings account or what have you. Every institution is not the same. They have their different rates or that kind of thing. And then in terms of that board of directors for your financial institution, walk in or schedule an appointment exactly. and interview them. Don't That's just right. Because, because when you um, deposit that windfall at that financial institution, what's the first thing that they do? They take your money and then they invest in other <laughs> businesses. So don't That's you right. want to have a return on your investment by having a, 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 a relationship that um, empowers you? Sabrina, I, I really couldn't have put it better. At the end of the day, you have to invest some time and you've got to, you can't just go with the first person you come across. So thank you for that. I'm not going to add anything because you summed the per you've come, summed that point up perfectly. And, and someone, I, I, and someone also, I'm sorry, Monty, please. No, no, I'm listening, Sabrina, please. I, I prefer a more question answer personally. Uh, then also someone mentioned also only banking with credit unions. There's absolutely. So there's different institutions. You should interview them all. It's not based upon an advertisement or, or an institution that necessarily is on your block. There may be a one, and then you may say, well, I only want to have my money deposited at an institution that um, does not uh, rip off people. Maybe you care about the, the institution's ethics. Maybe you care mm -hmm. about that thing. So mm -hmm. then you find that they meet your ethics and your values and you interview them because you're giving them their money for them to use elsewhere, then you That's can right. make your decision. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question from Maritza and then, um, let's see. So Maritza said, um, I don't know, can you address future tax rates? Do you address that, uh, Monty? Or no? And then- I can put on it, Sabrina, sure. Oh, I, I might think that if you we look read, around. Right, you you well, want me to reread her question? Yes, please. Okay. She said, I'm interested in your thoughts about future tax rates. I believe that federal, state, and local governments will have significantly raised taxes in order to keep our country afloat. What do you think about funding Roth IRAs and paying taxes now? This is to further diversify retirement. Okay. Um... It sounds as though her fa mo fo most focused interest is on retirement. Depending on her income, she may not have to pay taxes on the Roth. What happens with the Roth IRA, normally the benefit, I should mention, is that when you withdraw money from a Roth IRA, you do not pay taxes, nor uh, under certain circumstances will you have penalties to pay well, when you withdraw. So she needs to do the research if she's young enough or at a certain income level or below a certain income threshold, a Roth can be a great advantage. But once you've got the Roth IRA, you've still got to think about the same issue you touched on, Sabrina. You put your money away. How do you want it invested? Is the professional who's managing that account going to make recommendations for you? Are you going to have a self-directed IRA where you make your own decisions? Uh, once again, we come back to the whole level of investing not only your money, but your time and education in order to make good ideas, in order to make sensible, I think, uh, proposals going forward. Yeah. One consideration I should, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm just going to say something really quickly. Yes, yes. Interest rates are at an all-time low and have been, and have continued to be, uh, we call it financial repression. 
where the Federal Reserve is basically pushing interest rates almost to zero. And most disturbingly, uh, this week, the Federal Reserve chairman uh, discussed the possibility of even going to negative rates, which is an absurd economic concept, but it's one where if you put money in the bank and you put $1,000 in the bank and you come back six weeks later, you're going to get back $997,000 because they've charged you to hold your money. So you want to be aware of the fact that as interest rates go down, this is, again, a sort of Damocles. Great for people who are getting mortgages. and We have clients who are refinancing at three and a half, two and a half percent. So fantastic rate. So if you're borrowing and your credit is good, you can get a car from a number of automobile manufacturers, no interest rate zero for 60 months. So effectively, the factory is paying you with their money to basically buy the car. Fantastic. If you're a saver, though, and you're trying to put money away, then in the old days, and in old days being 10 years ago, I'd always want to be able to buy for a client some portion of really boring, safe investments, CDs, money markets, et cetera. And it wasn't that long ago I could get you 5% on a CD. That would keep you maybe even our head with inflation. Now, if you go to a CD purchase, you could probably get maybe a 1.4 on five years. So you're below inflation. So we're forcing the economic environment and the Federal Reserve is forcing investors who may be very stable, conservative, um, risk-averse people to go out and take even more risk by buying securities to generate income for them because that's the only way they can make enough money to possibly, one, pay the fees on the account, and then two, stay ahead of inflation. What does this cause beyond my rant? Well, it causes them, as the investor, to think hard about, once again, education. If I'm going to take risk and go into the stock market to buy income, to buy income-yielding securities, which ones am I going to buy? And, and that's where a level of either support from an investment advisor or thought of, on your part and research will yield you very, I think, attractive results. Petra asked what website or publication is like the BBB, but better, which uh, uh, talks about how each bank treats their customers. I would go to the Consumer Federal Protection Agency that was founded by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and also right. go to bankrate.com and I'm sure there are others. Um, Rodney's asked about uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a long-term investment over 10 years. Maritza followed up with her question. We're already fully funding our regular 401k plan, so I'm thinking forward to Roth now. Okay, well, let me take the second question first. If you're fully funding your retirement plan and you feel that instead of putting money into a regular brokerage account, where you will pay taxes every year on interest and dividends that you receive, and you will pay taxes on capital gains, all of which are not uh, a tax implication are deferred within a retirement plan, you can always look at an annuity. You know, I have a lot of clients who say, listen, I'm kind of maxed out. I put everything away. I still have this money. I want to put it away. I don't need it. I want to put it away for my ultimate retirement or for my estate planning slash or both. And all, when structured correctly, an annuity can sometimes be, sometimes be very attractive. Please be aware that there are going to be fees on the way in, and they're probably what they call contingent deferred sales charges or CDSCs on the back end. So I tell clients, if you're buying an annuity, think of it as a roach motel. Your money's going in. It's not coming out anytime soon. Give it six or seven years or 10 years, but that can be a wonderful way to accumulate very large amounts of money in terms of contributions and growth. They can be a, a lifetime payout to you, which is one of the only situations in which as a licensed advisor, I can say to someone, you are guaranteed a lifetime income if you structure the annuity correctly, as long as it's company solvent. So that's a great opportunity. And maybe that might be an alternative um, to investing in a standard Roth, or perhaps the annuity might be placed within the Roth. I, I hope that's clear in terms of what I was trying to get across. And your thoughts about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a long-term investment over 10 years? You know, Bitcoin's a fascinating, or I should say cryptocurrencies are a fascinating concept. In effect, if you think about the dollars you have in your pocket, they're valuable only because we all agree as a society that they're valuable. If you were coming from a different planet and someone handed you, you're an alien, and someone handed you a dollar or a, a coinage in yen or euros and said, I want to buy your spaceship, the person, the alien might say, no, there's no value to me from this paper. So 
cryptocurrency really comes from the same concept in that there's particularly no inherent value to a cryptocurrency except that which the investors in it provide. But crypto's really been um, fragmented. So there are a number of different styles of it. There are over 100 different types of crypto that I've been able to review. And this is a, le- this is a process in which in- investors have got to do their homework. I mean, if you're, if you're listening to some craziness on a website telling you to buy either Bitcoin or Ethereum and you don't understand the concept behind, one, the blockchain, and two, crypto, then you should really just take your money and throw it out the window because you're probably going to get schnooked here sooner or later. You won't understand the forces that move those prices up and down. And you want to understand also in a lot of cryptocurrencies, the founders, the people who first started them, have fairly large positions. So if you're okay with that, that control they have of the flow of a limited product, you can be really well positioned. But I cannot stress enough, homework is really, really critical in this situation. Okay, so three action steps. You're coming back after um, Mr. Washington uh, presents on credit. Three action steps, and then everyone, <laughs> make sure you provide your questions. Uh, yeah, your questions. What do they have to do right now? Right now, Monty. Monty, right Thanks. now. <laughs> Sabrina, right now, I'm going to suggest once again, there is no way to minimize the importance of education. There is so much information available in podcasts, webcasts, et cetera. I'm gonna leave you again, I had mentioned them before, but I'll leave you three authors who I think are doing some absolutely extraordinary good work um, on thought of where the, where the economy is. And again, I'm gonna complement that with the fact that every, every, every reputable major law firm, I mean a brokerage firm, has probably 10 to 44 different exhibits that you can just go and take a look at and learn about. I'm going to give you again, Michael um, Maloney, he's written a fantastic book, which is called uh, Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. All my clients who, who've been with me for years know that I'm a nut. And I think that you got to have a portion of your money in gold and silver because it has been, and I mean physical currency, it has been money for 5,000 years and will continue to be. And as governments continue to print staggering amounts of money, I would want to have a portion of my assets diversified. I would take a very close look at Robert Kiyosaki. He has two fantastic sites, one for young people, like millennials aged maybe 18 to 25, which is really, really well done. And then he has another one on the Rich Dad, Poor Dad channel, um, which I think covers some really, really fascinating ways to look at, one, the world economy, and two, how to make money. And then again, for those who are more sophisticated, I cannot stress, James, James, Jim Rickards has written five books, each of which is a fantastic document. But I would say look through the series of the books and take a look at those. If you've got higher level of sophistication and more liquidity, that means you have more money, more problems. If you can protect your money as you understand the problems, you will be in a far stronger position. Hmm. Thanks so much. Monty, thank you so much. Please stand by. You're coming back after our next and final expert on credit, Mr. Monty Henry. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, so credit in Greek is means trust. And one of the most debilitating industries that has impacted generations, even we didn't when we when we didn't even know it, has been credit. And uh, years ago, I met Mr. Washington and heard his his wisdom and saw his wisdom that's not, not universally known. Um, know that he's going to be an asset to you today in terms of information. Please welcome Mr. Darrell Washington. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, D. Alexander Washington, president of Washington Consulting Group, And if someone would have told me prior to August of 1981 that I would be in financial services, I would have laughed in their face, turned around and walked away. But what happened in August of 1981, I was invited to go with my financial advisor to a financial conference in Atlanta. And while there, I met so many people from across the country 
working in financial services and listen to all the different stories of how beneficial it would be to understand and offer financial products from reputable companies to the masses. Now, in 78, I had a daughter and her mother wanted to buy a house. Prior to that, uh, I owned my own convenience store. And I said, buying a house was a big uh, responsibility. And I looked into it and decided that that was the best route to go. Uh, her mother, my daughter's mother, their parents referred their insurance agent to us. Uh, you're making a big purchase, it's a financial responsibility and you should protect yourself in case of a premature death. But when the agent came to my home, he confused me. I didn't know if I was talking to an insurance agent or an undertaker. And it was a very difficult conversation for me to listen to from this gentleman. And it turned me off so bad, I, I just couldn't see myself buying death insurance. And I passed on it. I bought the home and I already owned the business and things were going well. And a gentleman came into my store and just in conversation said that he was an insurance agent, but he also owned a personal home care business in the neighborhood. And, and he sold women clothes out of the trunk of his car. Uh, this guy was a real hustler, <laughs> but he was a really nice guy. And he frequented my store and we just became friends. And I told him, I said, I bought this house. I said, I did meet with an insurance agent. I didn't really like his presentation. Uh, is there anything that you can offer me? And he asked some questions, the value of the house, my age. And he gave me a proposal. I took it, did, put it to the side for a minute. And then when the time came for me to actually buy the house, I got a mortgage, illustra mortgage amortization. And I went back and grabbed the insurance illustration. And I was looking at the numbers on both these documents. And I noticed in the 17th year of the amortization and the illustration that it, I would accumulate enough money in my life insurance policy to pay off my mortgage. So I called my financial advisor at that time, he became my financial advisor. I called Luther and I asked Luther, can I take this money out my life insurance and pay off my mortgage? He said, why not? It's your money. I said, but in the 18th year, I get more money. He said, yes. I said, when I go down to the 30th year, I earned back all the money I spent the first 17 years. He said, do you have a problem with that? <laughs> I, said, I said, no. I said, but what happens at 30 years? He said, you can convert the income. You can convert the accumulation, which is called the return of premium, into a life income that you can't outlive. I said, let me understand this. I can buy my house and buy this insurance policy, pay off my house in 17 years, recoup all of my money and convert it to a, a life income that I can't outlive. He said, yes. I said, is that legal? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, how come everybody's not, why don't everybody do this? So that had, I bought the policy, bought my home, but I still own my own business. But when I went to this convention, it met all these people, it just changed my mind. And when I came back home, friends in the neighborhood would come to me because I owned a store, so they thought I knew something. And they would ask advice on what to do with their money. A lot of my friends were very talented. They played for the village people, Patty LaBelle, and they would go on tour, come home with money. And they would say, what can I do with $10,000? I would call Luther. They would say, what can I do with 20,000? I would call Luther. They went on a tour with the village people. They came back with a half a million dollars. And I called Luther. I said, look, I got a half million dollars. What can I do with it? He said, you don't have a half million dollars. I said, no, not me personally. Some friends have the money. What can they do with it? He said, you can't tell them. I said, why? He said, you have to be licensed to tell people what to do with their money. And that's when I made that push in August of 81 to get into uh, licensing so I can help people with their money. And he wow. sponsored me with New York Life. Wow. I got into the business and my focus was, I created a plan called MAP, Mortgage Amortization Program. 
which was a whole life insurance policy combined with a mortgage amortization to prepay the mortgage, get a return on your premium, and it averaged somewhere around 44% return on your money. I created this program. I sold 160 plans, 66 plans my first year in the business. No one in New York life had ever did it before me or after me. And what happened is that with the training, I found out that just buying a house and insurance was the basic part of the plan. The crutch, the foundation is money management and understanding credit. When I first got involved in the business, credit was getting a letter from the utility company saying you paid your utility bills on time, getting a letter from your landlord saying you paid your rent on time, getting a letter from Tony, the grocery store owner at the corner said that you had a book with, you had money on the books with him and he trusted you to pay at the end of the month. And you could give that to the bank and they would use that as your credit reference to offer you a mortgage. But then times changed where they started credit scoring. But the good thing is the federal government stepped in under the Fair Credit, under the Federal Trade Commission and created guidelines that dictate how subscriber, the subscriber is the creditor. They have to follow guidelines in order to submit information to the repository. And the repository has to follow guidelines in order to distribute the use of, cons of consumer's credit. 22 guidelines with 122 sub guidelines. This is like the criminal justice system. And this is what I advise my clients. When you review your credit report, look at information on in your credit report as though you're being accused of something. You're either being accused of using good management for your credit, or you're being accused of using poor management of your credit. And you have a right to defend yourself when you're being accused poor management of your credit because Subscribers can make mistakes, just like the district attorney can make mistakes. So when there's negative information on your credit report, they have to validate that information. So in my practice, I tell people I'm not in the business of credit repair because credit isn't broken. There's nothing to repair. Credit works real well. You got to pay it up to the time you die. And in most cases, you have to pay, it has to be paid after you die. And the, the, it's, it's, it's semantics. I had a conversation with my granddaughter the other day, and I said, if the bank put up a sign saying, come on in and get $15,000 of debt, would you walk in there? And she said, no. I said, if it's a everyone approved for $15,000 worth of credit, would you walk in there? She said, yeah. I said, but what is credit once you use it? It's debt. And this is what a lot of people I find have problems when, it's looking, when they look at credit the, and, and building credit, they look, they look at the words that's being used, not recognizing that the words being used is being used to kind of trick them, is what I call it, into overextending themselves. So as I got involved in selling insurance and different products, estate pro doing estate planning, I started coming across people who were renters. So the, the MAP program didn't really work for them because they didn't own a home, they were tenants, but I wanted to get them on the path to home ownership. So I structured the budget and the budget was very simple. 10, 10, 10, 35, 35. And what that meant is when I sat down with a person, I said, when you go to a bank to apply for credit or a mortgage, they look at your gross income, but no one lives on their gross income because you pay taxes. So you live off of your net income. So I'm going to qualify you for credit or mortgage on a net income. And that way I know that you would more than qualify on a gross income. Uh, I lost my screen. No, we see you. Oh, okay. Ill, Ill oh, okay. So the 10, 10, 10, tithes and offering. That's the first 10%. The second 10% is uh, savings. And I split that 5% into 
an annuity or whatever investment that you choose and 5% into a savings account because you want to have some liquidity if something pop up right on hand. 10% you spend on yourself. 35% to cover your mortgage or rent, utilities, auto insurance, childcare, food, and 35% to retire old debt. If, by living on this formula, a person can substantiate the ability to manage their obligations. And when I get involved with setting up these budgets, what normally happens are people are so upside down because when I asked how they budget prior to us meeting, it was always creating debt and trying to fit it into their income rather than creating the income and having the debt fit into the income. And then the clients who had bad debt, not bad credit, but bad debt. In other words, they owed people that they were struggling to find a way to pay. And I would advise them, let's not look at how much you owe these 10 people. Let's look at the 35% to retire the debt and divide the 10 people into the 35%. And okay, each person... Uh, okay, so let me just... Because a few questions are coming up. Okay. All right. Let's say that any of our, our co-hosts here, uh, our attendees, they have debt that's weighing them down, okay? And um, and they want to buy a house. They want to, you know, make some financial moves or what have you. How should, you said that the their credit report is an accusation. How should they review their credit report? And what should they do about those accusations on their credit report to change their, to change your credit score? Second question, Mr. Washington, you also, I know that you are, you're aware of another, besides TransUnion and Eper, um, Equifax, there's another um, rating system that a lot of people don't know about. Could you talk about those two, please? Well, there's over 2,000 repositories. The top three is TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Wait a minute. There's only over 2,000 repositories. Credit, rate, Meaning credit rating, rating uh, credit bureaus, credit, credit bureaus. bureaus. Okay. okay, they're tech. They're not a bureau. They're a repository. But okay. people know the pe They're they're generally called bureau, credit bureaus. But they they're technically well, they are credit repositories, and there's over two thousand of them. But the top three is TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Do they work in concert with those two thousand repositories? All of them work independent of each other. Okay, go ahead. All work independent. And they use generally what's called a FICO score, although one is a beacon and one is an imperial. And now you got Credit Karma, and they are pushing for legislation to be accepted as a, as a regular uh, evaluation of credit use under what's called a Vantage scoring. So that's why if you look at Credit Karma credit scores and you only get two from TransUnion and Equifax, those scores are evaluated differently than a FICO score is. And within, and then you have what's called personal credit profiling and you have what's called full-factorial credit profiling. Full-factorial is what a lender would pull from like a CSI or a factorial data. But consumers can go to Credit Karma, which is not a repository technically, or they can go to Free Credit Report, uh, True Credit Report, ScoreSense.com. These all will give you a snapshot of your credit report and a uh, separate type of evaluation of your credit score because there's about 10 to 12 different matrix out there that helps accumulate your credit score. Okay, okay, we got we, we got that. So there's over 2,000, there's a top three. How do we review those? Because there aren't there's, there's statute of limitations by which a creditor can collect, correct? Or a way that we can proactively address what's on that credit report for accuracy, challenging the debt, challenging the amount, when the alleged uh, debt was created. Talk about that, please. 
Okay, you have what's called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which has a group of statutes that dictate how the subscriber can submit information to the repository and how they can display it to other creditors or subscribers that want to see it. Then you have state statutes that's under the Fair Debt Collection and Reporting Practice Act. Under that statute, that determines the fiduciary liability of a debt and if there's a statute of limitation on the collection of that debt. Most debt is insured. And if the company exercised their insurance, the consumer may not have a fiduciary liability to that debt. And in some cases, if the creditor wrote the debt off for a tax credit, which means they told the government, we're not going to pursue the consumer for this debt, they may no longer have a fiduciary liability to pay wait, that wait, debt. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again. Most debt is insured. And if the creditor took a write-off claiming a tax deduction because they're indicating they're not pursuing the consumer for that debt, the consumer may no longer have a fiduciary liability to that debt. How do we know? That's where I come in because I go in to do the validation. Okay. Now, um, Nakia is asking, is the MAT product still available? How can I find out more about it? Is the what still available? The MAT product? M-A-T? I don't know the MAT product. Nakia, could you clarify? Um, okay. So, so that's where you come in. Um, so in terms of also determining the validity in terms of collection opportunities by that creditor, how do we know that? Is there a statute of limitations for that? There's generally a, a statute of limitation on everything. The misconception is that seven year uh, term when they say if it's been, if it's been seven years. Seven years means if the creditor has not pursued the debt for seven years, they may not be able to pursue the debt going forward. But if the creditor pursues that debt, every regular reporting cycle, then they can report it forever. And that's because they're paying to. The repositories do not collect information. The subscriber pays to report that information and they can contract with the repository under a 30-day reporting cycle or a 60-day reporting cycle or a 90-day reporting cycle depending on how frequently they report determines on how much they pay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what if you have a particular, you remember in college, you open up a cell phone account with XYZ company and that company has written off that debt and transferred it onto a, an, a, an entity that buys debt and now they're calling you. What... Um, what do they need to show you? And particularly if they have you, they're suing you or whatever, you're trying to get rid, you know, satisfy this, that they legitimately own that, that debt. Well, they can legitimately own a debt. I actually have an associate that owns a debt collection service. He buys what's called uncollectible debt. And he buys it so cheap, he only expects to get 10% of what he purchased. So Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is uncollectible debt? What does that mean? Because that's a whole industry. Talk it about is a whole debt. industry. Yeah. It is a whole industry. Yeah, see, in, in a lot of jurisdictions, the consumer under state law is not required to deal with a collection service. So because they bought the debt from a, from a creditor, it doesn't mean they have the ability to collect it. In, in Pennsylvania, it, this, the, under the statute, under the Fair Debt Collection Reporting Act, it states that Pennsylvania residents are not required to deal with a collection service. So you send, they send you a collection notice, you send them a letter, cease and desist. So what is the relationship between the collection agency and the um, alleged company of origin? Well, usually it's a contract. It's either a contract to collect for the original creditor, which is different than if a collector purchased the debt to collect for themselves. Because the collector purchased the debt for pennies on a dollar. Mm -hmm. Now, if the collector contracts to collect, I used to have a merchant service uh, contract with a company and a client would bounce a check or a credit card payment would be reversed 
And then uh, six months later, I get a check in the mail where a collection service collected it. I had no idea, but the collection service didn't work for me. They worked for the merchant service company. Okay. All and right. they will and they will collect. So uh, you have you have a lot of times. Like I just reviewed the credit report, and there are three collection accounts. But when it says original creditor, it says unknown. How how is that possible? How are you gonna have a collection on a credit report collecting for an unknown company? You gotta be collecting for somebody you know. So what is the proper response for everyone when they get a call from a collection agency? I'm not in a position to talk about this at this time, but I'll be willing to review anything you send me in writing and never, never confirm information. I like to confirm your social. I want to confirm your mailing. If you don't have it, you don't need it. Okay. And, it's, and what if they then send that information in writing? What is the proper response? Well, you look at who you originally owed and depending on where you live, you can bypass the credit collection agency and mitigate the debt. You never want to settle a debt. You want to mitigate the debt. What's the, the, de what's the difference? What's the difference? When you settle the debt, that means the district attorney is charging you with murder. But if you pay this amount, he's going to drop it to manslaughter. Mitigating the debt means it's an alpha deal. An alpha deal means you might have enough evidence to show I owe this money but I'm going to give you this to delete it from my credit report and not report any negative to any other credit report. Got it. Um, okay, so we're going, do you have any, uh, because we're going to bring everybody back, Mr. Washington, do you have any final points on, on this? And then we're going to bring everybody back and you can, we'll just have a group conversation to answer questions from everyone. Yes, because of this pandemic and all the changes that's coming on, I'm advising my clients right now, let's sit and put together a five-year plan for, and I want it in three steps. This is what you should look at. What is your financial ability for you project for the next 12 months? What do you project from the 13th to the 36th month? And what are you projecting from the 37th to 60 months? I think we should look at that because there's going to be a lot of changes over the next five years. Okay. What do you mean by that? Well, you should set financial goals. What, what, are you going, what are you looking to accomplish over the next 12 months? I know there's mortgage forbearance, there's rent forbearance, but that's if people who exercise those, those options, you are going to probably have some credit hurdles. So we, if you're going to do that, we need to make some plans on how we're going to recover going forward. Once we recover, what are your plans beyond that? Or what goals do you have? Are you going to look to start your own business? Is Uber an option for you? I mean, I, I, there's all type of things that's popping up. You have to come up with some type of plan to overcome this current pandemic. And what are you going to look forward to in the future based on what you project is going to be your income for the next 12 months? And then going forward from the 13th to the 20th to the 36 months and then from 37 to 30. Now things can change, but it's better to work with a plan than to work in the blind. Got it. Thank you so much. Everybody come on back in the room. Everyone in all of our wonderful attendees, co-hosts, please pour into your questions for anybody, everybody comments. Um, weren't they wonderful? Just so brilliant, so brilliant. <laughs> So brilliant. Um, Nakia uh, clarified that um, for Mr. Washington, the mortgage program insurance product that you spoke about at the beginning. Say it again. Um, Nakia was, was definitely... following up. She was talking about the mor mortgage program insurance product that you spoke about at the beginning. Oh, whole life policy with a mutual owned insurance company. That's very important, Being a, uh, buying your insurance from a mutual insurance company because not only do you get uh, a guaranteed return to premium, you get interest and dividends. And what I like most about it is usually around the fifth year, the return of premium is greater than the premium amount that you paid. And going forward, if there is a financial uh, difficulty, you can use projected incomes to pay your insurance premiums. I actually won an award 
for the most reinstatements of insurance policies in a year when I worked at New York Life. And how I did it is I looked at from the date of the lapse policy to the date of reinstatement, they would calculate the premium that would have been paid, and then they would calculate the earnings that would have been earned. So I was able to use that projected earnings to reinstate the policy, and then I would pop the policy, which means I would use the premium offset provision that would ensure that they would have that policy forever without making another payment. And they didn't like that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Um, Mr. Washington Petra asks, what are the ways to increase your credit score? Um, I can't get companies to decrease the interest rate for a credit card. How do I get them to do that? Generally, you can call and ask for a decrease in the interest rate, but they will also close your card. Hmm. Yeah, I did that for my mother and brother. They, they, my mother and brother was sharing a credit card. They had maxed it out. Uh, the payments they were making wasn't moving it. So they were getting calls from a company that kept offering to reduce the interest. And I told them they could do it themselves. So I sat with my mother, called the company, reduced it down to 2%, but they did close the card, which really didn't matter because it was maxed out already. Uh, for This is for everyone from Rodney. What are your near-term views on the economy once the quarantine is over? And you all are from places around the country, so you may speak to locally and nationally. Can I take a stab at that, Sabrina? Please. So I, I think it's going to be a it's going to be a bifurcated situation. There are going to be companies and individuals that do extraordinarily well. We have an opportunity here, and I, again, I like the word quarantine. Hate the word lockdown. Lockdown is a penitentiary term is a term used of penitentiary, penitentiaries. And we are only in prison if we think we are. So to the extent to which we're quarantined, we all have less time commuting. We all have more time to think and hopefully figure out what we're gonna do on the other side of this. Some people are gonna come out of this quarantine situation better because they've used their time really wisely as Mr. Washington suggested. Others will come out just, as, just where they were if they really, you know, tweeting all day and eating six, six meals a day. Other folks will come out worse because they've lost a job and haven't really figured out how to replace that income. So two things, they're gonna be companies that do really well because we're now gonna have a bigger part of our population who works from home, a bigger part of our population who's dependent on technology on a home-based situation, and a bigger part of our en environment that's gonna be focused on medical care, cleanliness, et cetera. So to the extent to which you're involved or in those industries that will do well from this, great. There'll be others that come out much worse, lower level service quality, service situations, restaurants, et cetera. So therefore it's gonna be very unpleasant and probably a depression level in terms of theoretical decrease of, of, um, of GDP of gross domestic product quarter over quarter for most of the population, but an extraordinarily powerful time for other groups of population. So obviously to the extent to which you can, you wanna either mitigate the results that are negative or place yourself in that group that's going to do very well going forward. So l let me add to to what Monty said. You know, I, I, you know, I, I look at this situation as you can choose, just like what Monty says, to be bitter or better. And and you have to, you, you, if you come out of this the same, then you've just wasted the last, you know, two months, three months, whatever time frame, you just wasted that time of your life. And I'm choosing to be the thermostat where I'm controlling to one, you know, educate myself more, be far more intuitive in terms of my work and my own self-development, you know, making it a point to go out and exercise and just because that exercise is going to do two things. One, physically make me feel good, but also two, transform my body so that I feel and look good too. So, you know, you, you've got to make a choice in terms of how you will transform and better yourself. You know, to be bitter or better, it's totally in your control. And I'm choosing that after this ends, I will not be the same, Shirley Ann. I'm choosing to be better in terms of how I live my life, how I view things, because I, I think we'd all kind of, we got beside ourselves and, I, and we weren't taking, we weren't appreciating the little things. And now just to be able to walk outside, I was like, wow. This is <laughs> so we have to get back to basics is my point.
Anyone else? Anyone else? So um, Kim said, people say, do not look at your 401k <laughs> at this volatile time. Is this good advice? Don't look. Don't look. Uh, if you, if you, go ahead. Sure, yeah. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead, Julian. No, I, I mean, yeah, sure. Your 401k is now a 201k. Okay, you're absolutely <laughs> right. But, you know, that's, again, to the point of what we've shared so far, where if you are retiring in the next year, then, you know, ideally you are not in aggressively invested. So, so if you were aggressively invested, yes, you're going to see some huge dips in your 401k go from a 401k to a 201k. But it's all about, you know, buying low and selling high. And right now, everything is on sale. So if you're in a position to put aside more dollars towards your 401k, put aside more money towards your investments, then you're just helping yourself for the future because the market will come back as it always does. And one of the upsides for employer-sponsored 401ks, depending on the employer's contribution, even with a low interest rate on the earnings, you're still ahead of the game because you automatically get that bump from the employer's contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, so we're gonna, uh, we're about to wrap in about 60 seconds. Um, uh, a lot of people, are, everyone's asking for your contact information. What would you like to share? We, we will also include um, the, the experts' uh, contact information in the follow-up email that you will receive. Um, the recording of this virtual hall is available on YouTube and um, we'll also send you the link for it. But is there any other, um, and I chuckled when Kim said people do not look at their 401k at this volatile time. I was afraid to look. I was afraid to look, you know, and, um, but looking at my, you know, my statements was actually my liberation by yeah. looking. Okay, avoiding is not the not the, the strategy. So in a, your final final wrap up, um, again, we'll be send, send your contact information. Just uh, give some some closing remarks, please. Unless there are any other questions from our co-hosts, anyone else have a, a, a question, a burning issue? Anyone else, the attendees? So, no one else? Everyone no good? I'll, I'll just add on what you just said. You know, don't stick your head in the sand. This is your chance to, to, to evolve and be better after this moment. Um, to be bitter, no, but to be better after the situation. And don't stick your head in the sand, reach out to your creditors, be far more aware of your dollars and your money. And that will be the most confident feel, feeling because the way you feel about your money permeates every aspect of your life. Jamie, thank you, Shirley Andrew. Jamie, this is really for you, um, the LLC, um, you said, just talk, just repeat a couple of things that you said regarding the LLC. Yeah, a, a limited liability company is a state created entity that helps to separate you personally from the business. Um, so if the, if you, if the business is under a, a suit or litigation, your personal assets are protected because you've incorporated um, your business in this shell, which is the LLC. It is not a way to be taxed. LLCs can be taxed as an escort. They can be taxed as a sole proprietorship. So when I ask people, how are you taxed? Um, and I hear LLC, that's incorrect. You're not taxed as an LLC. You have to choose how you're going to be taxed. And you, those, one of those three ways that I showed earlier is how you would be taxed. Uh, and someone asked, do you believe that the interest rates are going to increase significantly soon or over the next year? No, under any circumstances. The Federal Reserve has staggering uh, liabilities in terms of the treasuries that they have issued. They continue to issue at an unprecedented pace. If you raise interest rates in this country, two things happen. One, the ability of the Federal Reserve to manage that liability becomes far more difficult. And two, if you keep in mind that the Federal Reserve is actually owned by banks, it is a, it's a private institution with a 
public name and is owned by banks, then you'll understand that the banks have no interest in having interest rates go up because that would reduce the spread they make on what they're paying you, which is basically very little or nothing, and what they're charging you, which is on a credit card or loan, et cetera, which is quite significant. So no, the government has made a very clear expectation that they will keep rates low for a while. And the Federal Reserve has told you that. If you listen to any comment Jay Powell has made in the last 12 months or going forward, he's given forward guidance that rates are going to stay right about where they are or go negative. Uh, final question. This, this is to you, Mr. Washington. Uh, let's say that you have a, a mid-level uh, credit score, FICO credit score with a low interest rate. Can you ever, can you qualify to purchase a home? In, well, in today's environment, in order to purchase a home, you will need a 640 credit score. And a lot of municipalities, and I spoke to a client yesterday, uh, she went to a first time home buyer class. She's entitled to up to $15,000 of grants for the purchase of a home, provided wow. that she has that 640 credit score. 40. Okay. Well, thank you all, Mr. Washington, Jamie Coleman, Montague, Henry. Shirley Ann Robertson, thank you so much for joining us to our The World of Money, The Future of Your Money series down in, in the polls. We'd love to hear from all of the attendees, what subject matter should we cover next? Because um, we definitely want to give you the information that you need. So either email us or respond to the two questions down in the polls for the next subject of our town hall meeting. As you know, World of Money is a nonprofit organization. So you know we love you for your donations, your tax deductible donations. Just go to our website, the upper right cor hand corner for your tax deductible donations. Thank you so much. Be well, be safe, and see you soon on Zoom. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.